Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Peter Klein from the University of Missouri, and his lecture today is on production and the firm. Peter? Thank you, Mark. Uh, let me begin with just a few administrative uh, preliminaries. Being, being a keen observer of human behavior, I noticed yesterday as I was speaking and putting slides uh, up on the screen, numerous people in the back of the room going like this, <laughs> yeah. which, which suggested to me that maybe you guys can't see the bottom of the screen very well. <laughs> I have a keen eye for the obvious, but I have uh, made a few adjustments uh, one of which, as I mentioned yesterday, is that all of the visual materials that I'm using and, and I think eventually that other faculty are using as well will be made available to you or, or are, in some cases are already available to you uh, on the Mises website. So if you're a student at Mises U, if you go to the uh, Mises Academy group that's set up for Mises University, which you should all be registered for, um, on the front page underneath where it has the uh, links to the required readings uh, in advance of Mises U. There's also a link that has the visuals. And if any of you are on your computers now or you have your, um, your iPad out or whatever, if you want to bring up the slides, even now, the ones I'm going to do on production in the firm, you'll find a copy already on Mises.org, uh, on the Mises Academy site, if you want to have those and sort of follow along as we go. Otherwise, all of the slides will be uh, are, are there for you now. Uh, so don't worry if you can't see everything that's on the screen or if you don't, uh, if I put up, up a quotation and you don't get the, uh, or you don't have time to copy down the quotation, that's fine. Um, uh, everything is available for you online. Um, uh, I also tried to redo some of my slides to move things up on the screen. So, but, you know, uh, there's only so much you can do with, with the space that you have. Um, you know, we're still, here we are in the second week, uh, sorry, second day. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> <laughs> what, they didn't tell you? <laughs> no. Second day of Mises University, and we're, you know, working our way through the foundational topics of Austrian economics, very fundamental concepts about value and exchange and money and capital, the business cycle, economic calculation, and so on. Well, another one of those fundamental topics is the theory of production, or the theory of production and the theory of the firm. And that's what I want to talk to you about today and to suggest that Austrian economics offers a unique perspective on the production process and a unique perspective on the business firm. Uh, much of our discussion here will flow from the material we covered yesterday in our discussion of entrepreneurship as producers, uh, business people, are really a special category of entrepreneur. So the material we're covering today, think of it as an extension or application of our uh, not only the theory of entrepreneurship that we discussed yesterday, but the other fundamental concepts of, of the Austrian tradition that you've been discussing uh, in the last couple of days. Now, uh, let's start by thinking about firms. I mean, what is a firm to begin with? Now, if you ask the typical person, the man or woman on the street, you know, draw a picture of a firm, they would probably produce something like this. Uh, this is, of course, clip art, so it's a little bit neater and uh, prettier than what you would draw freehand. But most people think of something like this, a factory you know, a big building with smokestacks and, and there are workers in there and, and stuff's coming out, you know, automobiles or steel or widgets or whatever uh, are being produced inside a firm. That's what we mean by firm in sort of everyday language. Now, if you've had courses in economics, if you're an economics major at a typical college or university, you know, of course, that a firm doesn't look anything like this at all. A firm looks like this, okay? <laughs> Or if you're a graduate student, you know, a firm looks like this. Um, but, you know, what is it that we really mean by, when we talk about firms, what are firms, why are they important, what is it that they do? Well, I think it's useful uh, to start with some sort of basic elements of an Austrian approach to thinking about firms and thinking about the production that goes on inside firms. Right, I mean, the basic elements are things that you're already familiar with from your readings and from what we've talked about 
uh, in the last couple of days. You know, things like inputs and outputs, right? We talked yesterday about Menger's basic distinction between means and ends, right? So, so the, the, the process of production involves transforming means, raw materials, uh, intermediate goods, uh, what we call factors of production into consumer goods that, uh, are, you know, that can be exchanged in consumer goods markets. So we have inputs and outputs. Of course, uh, we have prices, the concept of profit and loss that we talked about yesterday. Now, these are all common uh, to the neoclassical understanding of the firm as well as the Austrian understanding. But Austrian approaches to production and to the firm incorporate some additional elements as well that are not commonly found in mainstream treatments. The concepts that we discussed yesterday of time and uncertainty, right? So production does not take place instantaneously. There isn't kind of a magic box in which you stick capital and labor and land and so on, and you press a button and poof, you know, cars come out the other end. No, production processes take place in real time. And in uh, discussions earlier today about capital and the capital structure, you know, uh, Roger Garrison's presentation with the Hayekian triangle and so on, you've already started to think about the temporal aspect of production. Well, that's important for uh, Austrian microeconomics as well as Austrian macroeconomics, right? There's also uncertainty, the critical role played by uncertainty that we emphasized yesterday in our discussion of the entrepreneur, right? Factors must be committed to production processes in advance of the final output, and without certain knowledge of how much output will be produced, what consumers will be willing to pay for that output, what the, what, what the proceeds from production in monetary terms will be, right? So those making decisions about production are always doing so in the face of uncertainty, not mere probabilistic risk, as we discussed yesterday, but true, genuine uncertainty about the future. And, of course, the centerpiece of the Austrian approach to production in the firm is the entrepreneur, right? The judgmental decision-maker who owns and controls productive resources and deploys them in various combinations to try to, in, uh, to, try to produce goods and services uh, that, will set, that will be valuable so that the entrepreneur can realize a profit and avoid a loss. Right, And the entrepreneur is pr- using the, the fundamental economic tool, fundamental tool of economic calculation. Right, Comparing these anticipated future returns against the present outlays that must be invested for production, looking at it all in a common unit, right, in a monetary unit, comparing expected monetary, anticipated monetary proceeds against monetary costs, trying to decide what should be produced, how it should be produced, is it valuable to be in production at all, okay? And uh, having those those anticipations or those judgments tested, if you like, against the reality of the market with feedback being provided through the profit and loss system, okay? Notice that the Austrian approach in sort sort of philosophically uh, epistemologically is what we call causal realist. This is one of the key distinctions between the Austrian approach to production and many of the mainstream approaches is the, the you know, emphasis on means and ends, right? We're interested in the kind of teleological or logical aspects of production, not merely the technical, physical aspects, right? So you take some neoclassical economics courses in the theory of production, and you think you're taking a course in engineering, right? It's all about combining physical amounts of outputs, of inputs in various ways, and sort of the technical aspects of production, returns to scale and so on. That's fine. That that, that is important, but hardly the, the, you know, everything that's associated with the theory of production. This is an economic approach, not a purely technological approach. And so that's the aspect of causality. We're interested in causation, how human agents employ means to try to achieve ends. And we're also being realistic in the sense that we want to explain, you know, prices, quantities, characteristics of real goods and services exchanged in real markets. We don't want to study hypothetical markets 
with hypothetical goods and services that exchange at hypothetical prices. So, if you've studied mainstream neoclassical production theory, you know that that theory is dominated by the model of perfect competition. The perfectly competitive general equilibrium model is sort of the benchmark, the gold standard of uh, analysis in mainstream production theory. We're not interested in perfect competition. We're interested in real markets, in real competition, real world competition, real prices for real goods and services. Okay, so the Austrian approach is both causal and realistic. Uh, I think it's useful to distinguish between two different aspects of thinking about production in the firm, both equally legitimate and both complementary. Okay? So one is what we might call the theory of production proper. Okay? So here we're focusing on the processes by which inputs are transformed into outputs. And we look at the economies or the production processes capital structure. We look at different orders of goods in Menger's sense, Bombavik's sense. Is the production structure or a particular production process lengthy or short? Is it more or less roundabout, to use Bombavik's terminology? We study the processes by which factors of production are priced. So factors of production are exchanged in factor markets. We want to understand what determines an entrepreneur's willingness to pay for a service unit of a particular factor. What explains a factor owner's willingness to rent or sell a unit of that factor? We're also interested in the concept of cost. How do entrepreneurs think about costs? What determine costs? How do costs change throughout the production process and so on? So those are, those are the aspects of production that deal with, again, the, the process of transforming inputs into outputs. Now, in mainstream economics, the theory of production is often labeled the theory of the firm. So you might have a course or a textbook or a, a, a chapter in a textbook or a section of a textbook called the theory of the firm. So maybe in your, in your course or in your text, they have part one, the theory of the consumer, part two, the theory of the firm. And what they mean by the theory of the firm is this. But if you think about it, right, the, 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 the first set of items here, this really isn't about firms at all. It's about production and the production process. Now, production takes place inside firms, also takes place between firms. But if we want to understand the firm per se, we're not simply interested in the production process, but the way firms are organized. So the theory of the firm proper deals with things like it tries to answer questions such as, why do entrepreneurs establish firms at all? Right? Because if you think about it, there are many different ways that production pro a given production process could be organized. So you have a given set, of given set of inputs, which can be transformed into a particular set of outputs. Well, that production process could be owned by one individual, or one group of individuals, one ownership team. Or you can have each factor of production is independently owned and the factor owners get together and sort of form a coalition to share their factors. Maybe the output is owned by one person or group or maybe it's jointly owned by several individuals. One firm could produce a single good or service or produce many goods or services, right? So a firm can own many production processes or no production processes by itself. A single production process could be jointly owned by multiple firms and so on. So if we want to understand the organizational aspects, we need to do more than simply look at the technical aspects of production. Why establish firms at all? What determines the size and scope of the firm? Should firms be large or small? Specialized or diversified? Hierarchical or flat? These kinds of questions. How should firms be organized and managed? So, so if you like... The theory of production deals with the firm as a productive process. The theory of the firm, per se, deals with the firm as an organization. So when we think about firms as organizations, we're not interested so much in the inputs and outputs, but rather the personnel. In other words, the firm as an organization is a collection of individuals. It's a team, right? How do we put teams together? 
How do we organize and govern teams? How do we monitor teams and so on? So the Austrian economists have something to say about both aspects of production in the firm. So let me say a few words about each. Okay, We'll start with the theory of production per se. Now, again, those of you who have been subjected to intermediate microeconomic theory at the typical university have had your head filled with lots of beautiful pictures of different kinds of curves and Oh, here's a, here's an ISO quant, ISO cost diagram, and there's a total cost curve, and here's the diagram that you, that you're all, you know, uh, uh, you know, that's been drummed into your heads over and over again, where you have a, you know, a marginal cost curve and an average cost curve, and all kinds of weird things going on. Um, if, if you look at Austrian literature on the production process, one thing you find is there are almost none of these curves, okay? <laughs> now, it isn't that Austrians don't like curves, per se. It's that the Austrian approach finds this particular way of thinking about production to be at best misleading and at worst, you know, positively harmful. Okay? So we don't want to look at these curves per se, but think about a, a logical treatment of the production process. Right? So in neoclassical production theory, what do you do? Well, you start by taking most of the relevant prices as given. Okay? So assume that the firm purchases inputs in perfectly competitive factor markets, it sells its output in a perfectly competitive output market, find the profit maximizing level of output. Raise your hand if you've done this before. They give you some equations and they say, you know, find the quantity at which marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. Wow, okay. Um, you know, it really doesn't take a whole lot of insight to do that. Okay, And if you've ever been involved in any kind of commercial activity, you know that that is absolutely useless from the point of view of a practicing manager. Okay, I mean, it, it assumes that all of the interesting problems have already been solved. Somebody has given you the cost curves and given you the demand equations, and all you have to do is plug in numbers, maybe take derivatives or something like that, or draw curves and look where they cross. Okay, uh, Now, you can get fancy if you like. Okay. Instead of perfectly competitive output markets, have a, you know, a downward sloping demand curve in the output market. And then you get a downward sloping marginal revenue curve. You can do other fun things. Uh, maybe you allow the, the firm to charge different prices to different consumers, so-called price discrimination. Maybe the firm can produce multiple products. Maybe there's some strategic interaction among the firms and you're looking for a, you know, so-called Nash equilibrium, something like that. But the basic logic of the problem is still the same. Okay, given market conditions, given the state of technology, given demand and so on, solve for the optimal decision, where the decision is usually something pretty simple like, you know, Q equals blank. Okay? What's wrong with this? Well, first of all, these kinds of models abstract from, as a polite way to say, ignore, right, time and uncertainty. So production is instantaneous, and there's no real uncertainty about what consumers will do once the product is produced. Uh, there's no causality. There's no causal explanation for prices. What I mean by that, this is a point that was uh, emphasized by Murray Rothbard, that um, suppose that our goal is to explain something that goes on in the labor market, let's say. What determines the wages that are paid to laborers in particular occupations? How do they do that in the standard treatment? Well, there's labor, there's a market for labor with supply and demand curves. Okay? Where does the demand curve for labor come from? Well, we start with a model of a profit maximizing firm with given input and output prices. Uh, you solve for the profit maximizing level of output. You then solve for the firm's optimal use of inputs, given those prices is the ISO quant, ISO cost thing for those of you who have had to do it. Right? And from that, you can derive the firm's demand curve, uh, you can you can write down a demand curve or derive a demand function for labor and plug that into your uh, labor demand and supply model to get the equilibrium wage. But notice, you start with a firm, you start with, with factor prices being given. So assume that the wage is, is fixed, is exogenously given. Use that to determine the firm's optimal use of the input Use that to derive the firm's demand curve for the input, plug that into the labor market model, and get the price of labor. 
So start by assuming you already know the price of labor and then use that to figure out what is the price of labor. Right? It's a circular, it's a circular line of reasoning, or more technically speaking, it's a simultaneous determination model. Okay, so essentially what you're doing is solving for a value of the wage such that all these equations uh, are, are consistent with each other. Okay, but there's no causal process of appraisement on the part of the entrepreneur. There's no imagination or creativity on the part of decision makers who are trying to figure out how to use resources in particular ways to achieve their goals. There are no means and ends. There's only simultaneous determination. Moreover, as Rothbard also pointed out, the, the sort of conventional approach, if you like, it's, it's told from the wrong perspective. Or, as Rothbard put it, places an emphasis on the wrong problems. What he meant was, look, uh, you know, suppose that all of this uh, body of theory were completely correct in that, you know, if given, given the production, given the production function and given the demand equation and so on, you know, find the level of output that equates marginal revenue and marginal cost. Well, I mean, if that's all the theory of the firm or the theory of production is all about, well, it's, you know, it's, it doesn't take a genius to do that, right? Somebody with a little, who knows that calculus or whatever can sit there and write down the equations. However, think about other problems, right? How did that production process get to be there in the first place? The agent, the manager whose job it is to set MR equal to MC, who hired that person? Why was that person placed in charge of the production process and not somebody else? Why is the production process producing output A and not output B or A and B? Right? Why was the firm or the plant established in this place and not in that place, at this time and not in that time, right? None of those questions is addressed in the conventional theory of the firm. Those are all sort of exogenous to the problem. Rothbard said it's as if the uh, uh, sort of theory of the firm is told from the perspective of the plant manager. Okay, so you've got an assembly line somewhere producing cars, and there's a guy there who has his finger on the button Right, and he can turn the, or he has a little dial, and if he turns it one way, the assembly line speeds up, you get more output. You turn it the other way, it slows down, you get less output. The job is to find, you know, how to turn the wheel. Okay, fine. If that's an, if, maybe that's a problem that the firm has to deal with, but that's a trivial problem compared to the bigger problem of how did all that stuff get to be there in the first place? Right? All of that is exogenous to the mainstream theory of the firm. So rather than telling the story from the point of view of the entrepreneur, the judgmental decision maker who owns and controls productive resources and makes decisions about how those resources will be deployed, it's all told from the view of the guy who turns the little dial. Okay, That's one of the reasons why in the early 20th century, when economists began to theorize about socialism, there were many well-trained economists who believed perfectly sincerely that socialism was just as productive as capitalism. That a centrally planned economy could allocate resources just as effectively as a free market economy. Why? Because they said, well, I mean, anybody can sit there and turn a little dial. Why can't it be a socialist worker? Right? Why can't the state set up the factories and the state can put people there to turn the little dial? And you just tell them, hey, here's what you do. MR equals MC. Okay? You figure out how fast to run the assembly line to equate marginal revenue and marginal cost. It'll be just like capitalism. Okay? Because they had been trained that that's the essence of capitalism. Profit maximi the profit maximizing firm where everything is given. No, the essence of capitalism has to do with where all that other stuff how all the given stuff came to be given. Where did all that stuff come from? That's a problem that no socialist model has been able to solve, has attempted to solve. How do you allocate capital to various production processes? How do you allocate capital across the economy to various industries, branches of industry? How do you determine which individuals will be in control of which resources? Right, That problem is not addressed by the socialists in part because it isn't addressed in the mainstream theory of the firm. How do Austrians approach the production process? How do they approach production theory differently 
from the neoclassical or mainstream approach. Well, you've already heard a lot of this in lectures yesterday and today, right? We go back to Menger and Bombavirk and Mises and Hayek and other important contributors to the Austrian tradition, right? Uh, Rothbard's book, Man, Economy, and State, has a whole section, has five chapters devoted to production theory, which, you know, if you've if you've never actually, if you haven't worked your way through man, economy, and state, it's a, it's a valuable exercise. But I would urge you, just as a starting point, just to look at the table of contents. And you might actually be surprised if you think that Austrian economics is all about really sexy, esoteric concepts like, you know, banks issuing private currency and you know, <laughs> spontaneous emergence of rules and computer networks and so I mean, look, all that stuff may be relevant. I mean, Austrians have something to say about those things, but kind of the hard core of Austrian economics is pretty plain vanilla stuff. Valuation, markets, prices, production. So I, I published an article last year in the QJAE called The Mundane Economics of the Austrian School which you might enjoy take, just taking a peek at. And basically, I, I'm sort of chiding some of my fellow contemporary Austrian economists for forgetting that the essence of Austrian economics is this kind of stuff, is what I call mundane economics, things like production theory. And if you go back to Rothbard, he devotes a huge chunk of man, economy, and state to production theory. Okay, um, a, a, a very useful and somewhat overlooked Austrian book is a short book by Ludwig Lachmann, called Capital and Its Structure, which provides an excellent introduction, maybe the best introduction to Austrian capital theory, and I would highly recommend it. Right, The kinds of issues that are covered are factor pricing, what determines the prices of factors of production, uh, factor use, how are different productive resources allocated to different places in the, in the economy's overall capital structure and in the production process of particular firms. Uh, what explains uh, entrepreneurial profit and loss? And we covered some of that material yesterday. Um, well, I mean, just a, a quick overview of the Austrian approach to factor pricing uh, starts by d distinguishing among different factors of production and thinking about their different characteristics. Right? So land and labor are what uh, we sometimes call originary factors of production whereas capital goods are sometimes called sort of secondary or derived factors of production, meaning that capital goods are themselves outputs of some previous production process, right? So labor, human, human labor services, and land, which means sort of nature-given resources, not just physical land, but also raw materials, you know, ore and so on that can be mined out of the ground. We have those kinds of resources, and then we also have productive factors that are, have, have, have already been produced by previous production processes. Tools, uh, you know, sub-assemblies, uh, intermediate components, machines that help to assemble things, and so on. Right? And we can say something about the prices of both of these categories of factors. And the basic insight is what uh, was, was called by, by Friedrich Wieser uh, the theory of imputation. So the core Austrian contribution to factor pricing is sometimes called imputation theory, the theory of imputation. Right? Imputation means that the, the, the values of factors of production, and hence the prices that are paid on the free market for factors of production, are imputed from the values and prices of the final goods and services that those factors are used to produce. Okay, the value of good, of intermediate products, of factors of production, is imputed from the value of the final goods and services that those factors are used to produce. In other words, factors of production, such as labor, intermediate goods, such as machines, uh, assemblies, and so on, are valuable only to the extent that they can be used to satisfy consumer wants. Right? You learned yesterday and today about the basic Austrian approach to value theory. How value is subjectively perceived by consumers and how consumers express their valuations in markets through their willingness to pay for goods and services. 
Well, it is those values and hence the prices of goods and services in, 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 in the market for consumer goods that determines the values of the factors of production that are used to produce those consumer goods. How does it work? Well, uh, just a, a, you know, a couple of propositions uh, that, that are fairly easy to understand once you work through them. The first is that the rental prices of factors tend to equal what's called their discounted marginal revenue products, or DMRPs. Okay? Rothbard uses the term marginal value product, but it's a synonym for marginal revenue product, the, the, more, uh, the more common term that you guys have all seen in your classes. Right? Uh, why do I say rental prices? Well, uh, um, factors of production right, are, are used by producers, by entrepreneurs, uh, for particular periods of time, right? Think about a wage, right? I, I, my wage is so many dollars per hour or so many dollars per week or per month. So it's a payment per unit of time for the use of my rental services, right? So the employer doesn't buy, doesn't buy me. He doesn't purchase me outright. He rents my labor services, right? Just as you, you know, if you rent an apartment, right? You pay a certain amount per unit of time, so many dollars per month to live in the apartment, or you rent a car and you pay so many dollars per day, right? So likewise, an entrepreneur might rent the services of a machine from its owner and pay a certain amount of dollars, certain amount of money per unit of time. So when we talk about factor prices, we really mean rental prices, prices to use the factor or prices of factor services, okay? Um, and those prices tend to equal their discounted marginal revenue products. What's the marginal revenue product? Most of you know this already, right? That's the, you start, uh, the idea is if we, uh, at a given level of production, right, if we change our use of a particular factor, if we add one more service unit of a factor of production, we get a certain amount of additional output, what's called marginal product or marginal physical product. Right, So I, I use one more hour's worth of labor. Let's say I'm producing hamburgers. Okay, I employ an additional unit of labor. That unit of labor produces some additional hamburgers. Maybe you know five extra hamburgers. Now, if I can sell those hamburgers in the market for, say, $2 a piece, then that marginal unit of labor has generated 10 more dollars of revenue for me as a producer. Okay, So the marginal revenue product is the additional revenue I get from employing one more service unit of a factor. And of course, because production takes time, right, I have to discount that value back to the present because I'm paying for the factor now in anticipation of the revenues that will only be received in the future. And so depending on the interest rate in the economy, I have to discount those future receipts back to the present to determine my maximum willingness to pay for a service unit of that factor. Okay, so the discounted marginal revenue product is the most that a, a, a that an entrepreneur would be willing to pay for a service unit of a factor. And if there are multiple owners of those service units, workers offering to work, offering their labor, or owners of capital goods offering the use of their capital good, competing with each other, right, then in a kind of equilibrium, in a sort of a long-run equilibrium, those factor prices will exactly equal the marginal, discounted marginal revenue products, okay? This is pretty familiar stuff. Uh, Rothbard adds some particular caveats, right? He emphasizes that uh, th this, these, this, uh, this condition holds, right, uh, factor prices are equal to DMRPs only under certain conditions, only when certain subsidiary conditions hold, the factor must be non-specific, meaning it can be used in multiple production processes. So if you if you have a factor that can only be used to produce one particular output and cannot be substituted into additional production into alternative production processes, then it's the determination of its price is more complicated. Okay? Likewise, the factor must be what Rothbard calls isolable meaning it must be possible for the entrepreneur to isolate the contribution of this one particular factor from the contributions of all the other factors. So if you have what Rothbard calls an indispensable factor, so you have a, 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 a service unit of a particular good or service without which you can't get any output at all, 
then again, the determination of the price of that factor is a little bit different. As this has tripped many people up in thinking about the marginal productivity theory of distribution, as it's called. That uh, imagine an, an automobile, let's say. They'll say, well, you know, there's uh, uh, different inputs that go into the automobile, steel and, and plastic and all these you know, intermediate components, assemblies and so on, uh, plus a steering wheel. Right now, the steering wheel isn't the entire car, right? And the idea is, well, you know, if, 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 you, if, 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 if you reduce the amount of steel that goes into the car, you'd end up with a slightly smaller car, right? But it'd still be a car. You know, instead of a Hummer, it's a smart car, okay? You can still sell it. Let's say you get less revenue, but you still get some revenue. So you can isolate the contribution of a particular amount of steel to the value and price of the car. They say, but, but wait a minute, if... If you didn't have the steering wheel, then the car wouldn't be worth anything at all. Nobody would buy anything. No one, nobody would pay anything for a car without a steering wheel. So it's like, you know, with a steering wheel, the car is worth, you know, 25 grand or whatever. Without the steering wheel, it's worth zero. Or it's worth, you know, a, a few, a token amount or a sort of salvage value. Okay. Well, clearly the marginal revenue product of the steering wheel is very high in that case. Okay, but, but yet we don't see steering wheels selling for $20,000 or $25,000. So uh, the, the point is simply with an indispensable factor, we don't use the standard principle of marginal, of discounted marginal revenue product uh, computation to explain the price of that factor. We rely on other theories, other, uh, uh, other parts of our explanation, namely that there are alternative uses for the materials that go into steering wheels, there are many producers of steering wheels competing against each other, and the price of steering wheels tends to be bid down much lower than the full value of the car. Okay, so the point is there's certain there's certain caveats. Now, if you now some factors of production can be bought and sold outright. You know, a, a machine, one of those robots that does the uh, you know the welding on a modern auto assembly line, you can either rent the robot from an owner, or you can just buy the thing. Okay, what determines the purchase price of factors of production that can be bought and sold in their entirety? Well, it comes from anticipating the future stream of DMRPs that will accrue to that factor of production and sort of discounting them back to the present. Sort of coming up with a capitalized value of these future income streams. Okay? So the same basic principle of marginal valuation explains not only rental prices, but purchase prices as well. Okay, you know, if you think about imputation more generally, this all, this, you know, seems pretty straightforward. It's not all that radical to most of you guys. But when the uh, imputation theory was first proposed, it was, uh, it was quite a challenge to prevailing ways of thinking about it, right? The classical view of valuation and cost that was propounded by the Adam Smith and the British classical economists and found its way into Marxist thinking in the middle of the 19th century was that uh, what it, the reason that consumer goods sell at particular prices is because they have certain costs. In other words, the cost of production is what explains the prices of the final goods and services. Right, The famous, famous labor theory of value that is at least partly in Adam Smith and is sort of embraced by Karl Marx, right? That the value of output is determined by the value of the labor that goes into its production, okay? What the Austrian position did is is take that classical view and flip it on its head and say, no, it isn't that costs determine prices of final goods, but rather that prices of final goods determine costs, Costs don't determine prices. Prices determine costs. And what does that mean, right? Well, what are costs anyway? In mainstream approaches to production, you, know, you often get the impression that, that costs are just sort of, again, sort of magically exogenously given. Okay? The entrepreneur takes costs as fixed and then, you know, uh, charges prices by adding a little markup to the cost. Okay, But no, costs, what we mean by costs, are simply the sum total of the prices paid by entrepreneurs for the use of factors of production. And all of these costs ultimately are opportunity costs. All costs are opportunity costs. 
right? That's the Austrian concept of cost. When we say the cost of using a unit of labor to produce final good X is the value of final good Y that we don't have because the labor was used to produce X instead of Y. Okay? Mises famously illustrated this by thinking about champagne. Okay, you guys all like to drink champagne, of course. You know, undergraduate students drink some champagne every Friday night. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the Marxist sort of, the Marxist approach would, would say, well, why is champagne so expensive? Okay, you go down to the liquor store or the grocery store or whatever and, you know, a bottle of fine champagne, you know, costs 40 or 50 bucks. You say, why is champagne so darned expensive? Well, the classical approach is to say, but look, you know, to be, to be real champagne, not sparkling wine, which is not the same thing, right? To be real champagne, it has to come from a particular region of France, right? Real champagne is made out of grapes that are only grown in the Champagne region of France. Here's a picture of it. There's the Champagne region of France. And people say, well, you know, to buy land, it's really, ex- the land is really expensive there. Okay, land prices are really high. And so to be able to make champagne, you gotta get, you know, you gotta, uh, uh, have a vineyard and you have to buy the land there and it's really expensive to buy the land. So you have to pass that on to the consumer in the form of higher prices. That's why champagne is so expensive. Means it says, no, that has it exactly backward. Right? The reason why land is so expensive in the Champagne region of France is because people really like to drink Champagne. They're willing to pay a very high price for Champagne. And therefore, there are a lot of entrepreneurs competing against each other to get a hold of that land. And they bid up the price of land. The price of land is bid up because entrepreneurs are eager to get a hold of the materials that can be used to produce something that consumers like so much. So it's because consumers place a high value on the drink that the specific inputs that are used to produce the drink command a very high price on the factor market. Okay, Factor prices tend to equal their DMRPs, as we just said. And in a market economy, factors tend to be allocated to their highest valued uses in production. How does that happen? Suppose for some reason consumers decide they don't like champagne anymore. You know, some new study comes out that says that champagne makes you fat or whatever. And people say, that, you know, they don't want champagne anymore. They just want malt liquor or they just want, you know, they just want pure grain alcohol or whatever. And all of a sudden, nobody wants to drink champagne anymore. I don't know why those examples came to mind. Uh, nobody, wants to, nobody wants to drink champagne anymore. Well, the value of this land is going to fall, right? And it might turn out that this land is more valuable, you know, building resort you know, vacation resorts or condos or, you know, putting a Peugeot factory right there in the middle of this part of France or whatever, right? So if, in fact, consumers value other things that could be produced with this land more than they value champagne, well, the market process will tend to reallocate this land from growing grapes to making cars or use for condos or whatever, okay? Um, So remember, we're always thinking this through from the perspective of the entrepreneur who is is purchasing and commanding these factors of production and assigning them to different roles, trying to earn the highest possible profit, trying to avoid loss, right? Uh, Mises uh, and Rothbard use a particular equilibrium construct called the evenly rotating economy. The evenly rotating economy. And this is a hypothetical construct or what we sometimes call an imaginary construction. So just uh, imagine a world, not, not one that really exists, but imagine a world in which there is no uncertainty about the future. Okay, so there's still human beings in this world. They still go about buying and selling. They produce and they consume. But there's no uncertainty whatsoever with regard to what's going to happen tomorrow. Everybody does the same thing tomorrow that they did today. Everybody knows exactly what will take place tomorrow and so on. Well, Mises argued that in a world like this, you would still have some factor payments, right? Goods and services would still be produced. Land would be used to grow grapes, which would be made into champagne, which consumers would would drink and, and hence pay for, right? So you would still have markets for land and markets for champagne and so on. And all of those intermediate products would tend to earn prices equal to their discounted marginal revenue products. Every factor gets paid according to its contribution to production. Uh, there's still, in this imaginary world, there's still the passage of time. 
and there's still positive time preference. So people who lend resources would still earn interest as a reward for lending, for foregoing present consumption. Okay, so, so lenders, capitalists in their capacity as lenders would still own an interest, but there would be no profits and no losses. Why? Because if everybody knows exactly how much champagne will be demanded a year from now, everybody knows exactly what the equilibrium price of champagne will be, then all entrepreneurs come to the same calculation about what the marginal revenue product of a given piece of land would be. Okay, and the price of that land is bid up to where it exactly equals its DMRP. So entrepreneurs who produce champagne are paying for the factors of production exactly what their contribution to final output would be, and there's nothing left over. Okay, there's nothing left for the entrepreneur after he's paid for the factors because each factor is earning exactly its share of its, uh, uh, you know, its its share of final output, its contribution to final output. There's no money left over for profit, and there's no money for loss. Right, an entrepreneur would never pay more than the DMRP for a given unit of a factor, thus earning a loss, and cannot get factors on the cheap because everybody knows what these factors will be worth. Everybody knows the true DMRPs. Okay. The point is to show that the reason we have profit and loss in the real world, as we emphasized yesterday, is because the real world is not like this imaginary construct of the evenly rotating economy. There is uncertainty in the real world. Okay, Entrepreneurs don't know exactly what the DMRP of a piece of land is going to be. Right? They, they anticipate, or they make a conjecture, or they display judgment about what they think the value of that resource will be, and they make their bids and asks according to those uh, conjectures, those judgments. But they may be proven correct or incorrect. So outside of this imaginary equilibrium state, some entrepreneurs will be able to acquire resources on the cheap. In other words, they're able to acquire land at a price below its actual realized ex post uh, discounted marginal revenue product. And so they have some money in their pocket left over. Right? Other entrepreneurs will, so to speak, overpay for factors, will pay more than the factors discounted marginal revenue product, and will end up in the red at the end of the period. Okay? So profit and loss are solely attributed to the pervasive uh, uh, you know, state of uncertainty in which we find ourselves in the real world. Okay? Um, Let's spend just a moment or two talking about the firm as an organization, right? How are these productive processes organized within firms? Well, as I said before, in neoclassical economics, you know, there really is no theory of the firm. It's just production theory with a different label, with a different name, okay? Now, there is a, a branch of sort of modern quasi-mainstream economics, what's sometimes called transaction cost economics, or uh, uh, the so-called property rights view of the firm that are essentially mainstream in spirit, but do take seriously the notion that firms are not simply production processes, that firms are organizations. And they view the firm not as a production function, a production process expressed in math, but as a collection of assets or resources that are owned by one firm or another. So the boundary of the firm in this modern transaction cost or property rights view is simply who owns which assets. And the problem of firm boundaries is how to determine uh, uh, which entrepreneur owners will be in charge of managing which resources. Okay, so when we say, you know, uh, you know Microsoft, when we, when we think about the firm Microsoft, we mean the capital goods that are owned by Microsoft shareholders and the contractual relations between the Microsoft company and its employees, its suppliers, customers, and so on. That's what we mean by the firm. It's not a production function. It's rather a collection of resources that are owned and ultimately uh, governed by the owners of the firm. Okay, So the firm is the capitalist entrepreneur, or a group of capitalist entrepreneurs pooling their resources, plus the alienable assets that they own. Alienable means assets that you can buy and sell or give away. Okay, so the firm doesn't own its workers. 
right? It rents labor services from its workers, but it can own land and buildings and machinery and inventory and so on. Okay, so the capitalist entrepreneur plus the factors of production that he or she or the group owns is what constitutes the firm. And we should point out that ownership of a firm does convey a kind of authority. Ownership does convey authority. Um, some of you may be familiar with the distinction that Hayek made between what he called taxis and cosmos. These are two Greek words that were popularized by Hayek, famous essay, Taxis and Cosmos, where he distinguishes between what, what you might call sort of a designed or planned system and an unplanned or spontaneously organized system. Right? Many of you are familiar with Hayek's notion of spontaneous order. Right? So Hayek said there are certain systems that are designed from the top down, which he called a taxis, as opposed to spontaneous orders, you know, the market system as a whole. Hayek used examples like the common law and language and so on as instances of spontaneous order or sort of bottom-up, self-organizing systems. The point in this context is that the firm is most definitely a designed order. The firm is a taxis and not a cosmos. What I mean by that is not that within a firm, you know, there's some sort of tight hierarchy where the central managers control everything, you know, down to the last, you know, paper clip. That isn't the point, right? Clearly there is a lot of spontaneous order, if you like, inside organizations. But organizations are themselves distinct from the market. Organizations are a part of the market. They operate within the market. But if I own uh, some equipment... I own some machines and I hire someone to work with those, to, to, to help me work on those machines. I still have a kind of authority over the use of those capital goods that my employee doesn't. Okay? So there is a kind of teleology associated with the firm. Firms are constructed for a purpose. Resources are assembled to meet the goals of specific owners who want to earn profits or whatever their goals might be. Okay, so the firm is clearly a designed order, and there is a sort of authority, distributed authority, within the organization. Right, and notice that the theory of the firm as organization, as was already mentioned, is not conjoint with the theory of production, because a single firm can own many production processes, or a single production process could be jointly owned by many firms. Um, you know, what are some of the core questions that a theory of the firm would seek to address? Well, why do we have firms? What determines their boundaries? How should they be organized? And I'll just briefly mention a few insights into these issues that I think are worth pursuing. Um, in sort of the mainstream literature, a very famous article by Ronald Coase, published in the 1930s, called The Nature of the Firm, argues that firms exist to economize on transaction costs, Coase claimed that you know, buying inputs and outputs in the market in, involves costs of finding people to trade with and, and discovering the relevant prices that are prevailing in the market at that time and negotiating agreements and so on. And by internalizing activities, right, rather than going out and hiring a unit of a factor here and a unit of a factor there on an as-needed basis, if I employ individuals and tell them, look, you know, I own assets, I employ people to work on those assets, and I say, basically, I'm going to boss you around on a day-to-day -day basis, and I tell you to do this, and you do it. I tell you to go here, and you go there, okay? You can quit if you want, but as long as you work for me, you basically do what I tell you to do. That, that, that avoids me having to negotiate with you every time I want you to do X, Y, or Z, right? We, we, we simply negotiate once for an employment agreement that gives me the right to boss you around, rather than me negotiating with you on every single point, on every single day. Coase's argument was, under certain circumstances, that can be a more efficient way to produce, right? Because you don't have to bear all these, what he called transaction costs, negotiation costs, and so on, all of the time. Um, Frank Knight, in his book that, that I mentioned yesterday, Risk, Uncertainty, and Profit, offered a, a somewhat different argument for the existence of the firm. Knight's argument was that ownership of productive resources brings with it a kind of decision authority, a kind of ultimate authority about how those resources will be deployed that cannot be sold to someone else unless you sell them the assets. 
right? So if I own a machine, I possess the ultimate authority about how that machine will be used under particular circumstances. I can hire someone to work with the machine, and I can delegate certain rights to that person and so on. But at the end of the day, whenever a problem comes up, if there's a circumstance that's not covered in the contract, I'm the one who makes the decision about how that asset or resource will be used. Therefore, for entrepreneurs to exercise judgment, right, to have this kind of ultimate authority over the deployment of resources, they have to take possession of those resources. You have to own stuff, in other words. Okay, to be an entrepreneur in light sense, you have to own some stuff. You have to own a factory or some tools or some machines or some land or whatever. Therefore, entrepreneurs establish firms as a way of exercising judgment about future conditions. Okay? Um, what explains the boundaries of these firms? In other words, you know, how many assets should the entrepreneur own or control? Or in Kosa's terminology, how many transactions should the firm internalize? Well, here we have to appeal to uh, uh, secondary arguments uh, about the relative magnitude of different kinds of transaction costs, about the costs and benefits of managing or governing particular combinations of assets. Um, Murray Rothbard has a very interesting and important uh, insight on the limits to the vertical uh, uh, scale of the firm. So a very important argument about vertical integration and the limits to uh, the firm's ownership of assets, which has to do with the need to perform economic calculation. And Rothbard's argument in a nutshell, which I have on a slide that I'll skip in the interest of time, is that in order to uh, uh, the, the, a large firm that operates at multiple stages of the production process must have access to some external pricing information in order to make rational decisions about how to allocate capital across these different branches or divisions or departments. And the firm can never become so large that it is both the sole producer and sole user of some intermediate component. Because then it's like a socialist economy. Okay, so just as... uh, Professor Hulsman mentioned on Monday night that, you know, the, the way that Soviet planners were able to allocate resources imperfectly, uh, as they did, you know, was by picking up the Sears catalog, okay, and looking to see what factors were, what, what prices were being used in the outside market economy. Likewise, managers of a very large firm can also look to the external market to get some information used to price their own internally traded components. Rothbard said, if the firm becomes so large that there are no external markets, then the firm is in basically the same position as a centrally planned economy and cannot be efficient or effective and will eventually be outcompeted by smaller, more efficient rivals. So the theory of, of economic calculation, as I mentioned yesterday, is not exclusively about socialism. It's about the need for market prices for factors of production. Socialism, the problem of socialism is one application of that general problem. But the problem of pricing intermediate goods for a a private vertically integrated firm is another application, one that Rothbard uh, discussed in quite a bit of detail. Um, Okay, so just just, uh, to sum up... (laughs) to skip some brilliant material that I don't have time to discuss uh, because we stop at five, right? Okay. I mean, who who has the next lecture after this? Oh, Woods. Well, I'll just talk for two hours then. You don't want to hear him. You don't want to waste your time listening to Woods. Um, You know, what I want you to take away from this discussion is primarily that the Austrian tradition, that Austrian economics does offer a unique theory of production. It's not merely neoclassical production theory with words rather than math, which is the impression that some people uh, th- th- that some people have. Right? The Austrians offer a causal realistic analysis of factor pricing and factor use. Right? It's grounded in the core tenets of the Austrian tradition, such as marginal utility, uh, marginal analysis. It emphasizes the economic and not merely the technical or technological aspects of production. But I think that uh, production theory is, among within the last uh, couple of decades, sort of a, a relatively underdeveloped area. 
Again, as I mentioned before, a lot of work on production theory was done by the early Austrians in the 19th and 20th centuries. But it hasn't been the hottest area of research over the last few decades. And I think there's a lot more that remains to be done in this area. And those of you who are looking for thesis topics or dissertation topics might consider looking at some of these unresolved issues. Um, the theory of rent in particular, which we didn't discuss in any detail this afternoon, is, is, a, is a sort of an underdeveloped area in the Austrian tradition. Uh, there's a lot more on the internal organization of the firm. Uh, this is an area that I've been working on for, for several years, but there are many more questions than answers, I think. Um, relating uh, sort of macroeconomic factors or issues to these more microeconomic considerations is another important and extremely rich area that needs to be, uh, that needs to be addressed. How do firms adjust their behavior through different phases of the business cycle uh, when we understand the business cycle in Austrian terms? Much more in the way of critiquing the sort of mainstream cost curve analysis needs to be done as well. So I'm getting the evil eye from Dr. Thornton. So I'll draw it to a close now, but we'll have an opportunity to revisit some of these issues in other courses later in the week. Thank you. <laughs>